And this is March 1st, 2016. Tonight I have a real special guest and his name is Stefan Verstappen. I hope I said that correctly and you can correct me in a few minutes. Um, we're going to talk about the art of urban survival and he wrote a book on this and I mean I'm telling you if there was any disaster I wouldn't want to be with him I would want to be with him okay um so let me ask everybody are you guys really prepared for a disaster what if right now all the lights went out no internet yeah, you'd all be going through withdrawals, no cell phone, oh my God, even more withdrawals, no cash machine, no way to buy food, the gas pumps won't work, the traffic lights stop working, and the city comes to a standstill. Could you survive for three days or three weeks? So Stefan, in his book, has gathered some incredible essential information on what people everywhere can do to prepare for and survive any disaster. Now, it's, there's been a survey that says that more than 83% of Americans are unprepared to survive a disaster for even three days. And yet, even a minor disaster could easily force people to deal with an emergency on their own, possibly for days or even weeks before help arrives. So, Stefan, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me on, Kathy. Oh, I love it. You are so brilliant, I have to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> God, Thank I caught you off balance. I mean... You know, you're my kind of guy. You're you're a writer, you're an adventurer, you're a survival expert, and you know, you've conducted workshops everywhere and you've written six books, include including the art of urban survival, which we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, you know, I'm very, very honored to have you come on the show, so thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. I'm honored to be on your show. What <clears throat> what inspired you to write the book? Well, um, I was teaching martial arts um, for many years, and um, it started off, uh, you know, most people would like to learn, like, self-defense. And so I taught Krav Maga and survival and self-defense courses. And um, and it, it's good. I recommend everybody have some self-defense training. I mean, you know, it's a couple of months of one night a week or so, and uh, and then go, you know, once a year and uh, renew the course and get some training in because it can always come in handy. It's it's like an insurance policy. You hope you never collect on it. You know, um, you know, you don't buy car insurance hoping that you're going to get into a car accident. And the same thing, you know, with a little bit of survival training or a little bit of self-defense training, you're not buying into this hoping that you're going to have to use it. You're hoping that you don't have to use it. But if something were to happen, then you know you'd be way better off having a little bit of training. So the problem is, though, uh, what I wanted to get across to people is that. When you take self-defense training, people typically envision a mugger or the uh, a stranger rapist. Um, you know, you're walking down the street and somebody jumps out from a, a dark corner and, and, and tries to rape you. The problem is that that is really the least dangerous thing that can happen to you in a city. There's a lot of things that uh, are more likely to happen than you being mugged or you being raped. And so I wanted to include that into the self-defense. And the other thing too is when you take a self-defense course, the implication is that the solution to every problem is violence. Now, when I taught it, I always you know, mentioned that Violence is the absolute last solution. If you find yourself in a dark alley having to fight six armed attackers, and, and then well, you've made three big mistakes already. And those mistakes are you know, strategic. They're mistakes of intelligence, not mistakes because you're you know, not a good, good fighter. So, but in the uh, in the context of a self defense course, I, you know, I would devote the last ten minutes of the class to try and bring some of these ideas uh, uh, to the f forefront. But 
you can't really do that. So instead, what I did was uh, I started writing, you know, notes, take home sheets for the for my students, uh, you know, how to avoid situations where you would have to use violence. And this eventually evolved. Uh, you know, for many years, I was an instructor for St. John Ambulance and uh, um, you know, I'd, I'd done the Outward Bound program. I was a wilderness survival instructor for uh, um, a youth home here in Toronto. So I wanted to bring that into it too, because you know, it's not just that you live in a city and the only thing you have to worry about is crime. No, there are many things that you you you, you should know about, and it's all part of you know, like a the way of the warrior, the way of self defense. You should know how to handle yourself. In an emergency, because, you know, you can't always rely on somebody to save you. And especially if it's a, it's a disaster that would affect a whole city. So all those take-home notes kind of evolved. And so I wrote The Art of Urban Survival, which, um, you know, I tried to emulate my favorite books when I was a kid, which was like the Boy Scouts manual. You know, it had everything in it, how to pitch a tent, how to, you know, build the fire, how to build a canoe. So I wanted something like that for people that lived in the city. So it's got everything in it, you know, how to prevent crime, self-defense techniques if you do have crimes, um, how to secure your home, what to do if you're in a car accident, what to do if you have to take public transportation or if you get lost in a bad part of the city, um, how to improvise weapons, what to do if that city's on fire and you have to evacuate. Well, so it's you all also in there. Did, oh, if I could, is that, yeah. you know, it, it is like a manual and because I have the, also the book in my hand, and you've got it divided into three sections. One is surviving predators. The second is surviving natural disasters. And then the third is surviving social disasters. Now, you know, I love it because you address things that, you know, a lot of people don't even want to look at. So when you say surviving predators, what are you talking about? Well, I based, you know, that division into uh, three based on uh, nature. You know, I'm a, I'm, I love nature and I, I love to study it. And there are, you know, when you're an animal species on this planet, there are two things that will kill you. One is predators. You know, most of life on this planet is eat or be eaten. Uh, it's, you know, it's kind of cruel and nasty part of, of nature, but, you know, it's it's the way things go. Um, the second part is natural disasters. You know, I mean, animals can be eaten by another animal or, you know, there could be a forest fire or there could be an avalanche or, or a flood. And uh, but the third hazard that is unique to humans is social disasters. We are subject to predators. So in the, in the law of the jungle, if you're a, a sheep, then you have to worry about wolves. If you're a human in the law of the jungle in the city, uh, you have to worry about criminals. So the first chapter, you know, is defense against predators, meaning defense against various types of criminals, everything from, you know, muggers and stalkers to street gangs and, and, and carjackers and things like that. The second well, I, is... I, if yeah. I could, I, I, you know, what I like and I just want to bring up is that you describe what a predator can be like and you describe what a sociopath is like and you know what are some of the key characteristics of a sociopath so you can recognize these people and run like the wind so to speak right yeah actually you know that first chapter of the book is called defense against the psychopath and I created a video based on that chapter and it's you know it's gotten over half a million hits it's really popular and you know there are natural predators in nature and we think that we are on top of the food chain so there's nothing that eat us anymore we, you know we're not worried about a cougar eating us unless you live in you know up in the hills in, in California which occasionally still happens but generally we're not worried about being eaten by another animal but nature abhors a vacuum, you know. Anytime there is a niche, a food source in nature will evolve a predator to take advantage of it. So human beings actually have a natural predator, and those predators are what we call psychopaths. Um, 
they are devoid of conscience. They no lot more care about, you know, the rest of humanity than, you know, a crocodile cares about the zebra it's eating. So, um, the, you know, in order to, uh, you know, I'm also, uh, my first book to regress here for a second is uh, based on Chinese military strategy and, and the famous strategist Sun Tzu wrote, know your enemy and know yourself. So the first principle is know your enemy. So that's why that is the first chapter in the book. If you're going to survive in this society, you have to know what the primary predator of this society is and know what their characteristics are and then learn how to avoid being a victim of them. And the primary predator of our society are psychopaths. So, did you want to respond to that? <laughs> Hello? Kathy, are you muted? Yeah, I was. Oh. <laughs> okay. and, and, and then a pop-up appeared, and it's like, God, what is this? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, well, that's actually I can go on and on, but I thought I'd give you a break. Yeah. To, to oh, thank jump. you. Yeah, catch me off guard, huh? <laughs> uh, but it is true because I've also read, you know, I don't know if you know Scott Ritter, who was in the military, and he wrote The Art of War as Applied to the Peace Movement. And mm -hmm. he has all these strategies in there. And that is one of them. You know, you really need to know what you're up against. And, you know, then you can actually make better judgments. Yeah, absolutely. So, they cause the most problems in our society. They're behind almost all the bad things that go on. And so, well, we've got to know about them, you know. Let's study their behavior. And then when you study them, you can predict them. And this is the key to survival in any situation is trying to be able to think ahead what's going to happen and how to avoid it and prepare for it. And so it, once you study psychopaths, you're better able to predict what they're going to do. And therefore, you're better able to protect yourself. Well, you even um, share with people in your book, which I also love. I really love your book, um, how to really look at people and their body movements and, you know, how to tell when they're deceiving. And could you give us some of the examples of that? Well, you know, it's an imperfect science, but there is a lot to be had from being able to read people's body language. Now, from my years of uh, training in martial arts, um, I'll be honest with you, I can tell a, a lot just by the way the person walks. I, I can spot a person 50 yards away and pretty much deduce whether or not there are any threats to me just by the way they move, by the way they walk. Because, um, you know, your personality and your physiology is inter, in, interconnected. And so... Um, your personality traits will manifest itself in its in your body language. And if you're able to read that body language, then again, you're able to see things and, and be able to predict things. Again, the key is to be, uh, you know, to see what's coming. So there are some some body language traits. It's under the chapter how to tell when somebody's lying and you know it comes with a big caveat I, there's a lot of people that claim that you know they can tell definitely by body language and, and certain tells which is like a, a uh, what what the poker players try to do when they're bluffing you know they might have a twitchy eye or something like that and other poker players will read them and be able to predict what their hand is going to be but generally um you know, there's different ways that people lie and they will reveal their lies through body language, but also they'll reveal their lies through logical fallacies, things that just don't make sense, that give you a feeling like, geez, that doesn't add up. So when you combine the two, you know, reading the person's body and then what, you know, I guess you call higher criticism, which is, uh, it's not being critical of people, but it's rather examining the internal logic of a story to see if it adds up, you know. And so the internal logic of a person's story might not add up. Like, for example, the person tells you they're a doctor, but they, they don't know what the word stethoscope means, you know. So well, that's a pretty big clue that they're lying about being a doctor. Um, 
so you, you have to combine the two together. I list a bunch of uh, uh, tells in the book, the classical ones where, you know, uh, one of the myths is that you look a person in the eye and they won't look you in the eye when they're lying. Well, that's such a myth that every liar is sure to look you in the eye when they're lying now. So you can't go by that one. But they may, uh, the, the blink rate may increase when they're lying. So uh, they'll be telling a story and their eyes will blink once every two seconds or so, which is natural. But then when they get to the part of the story when they have to make things up, their eyes start blinking at a faster rate. For example, that is one clue that would tell you they're lying. Um, gestures that would indicate that they're hiding something would be like putting their hand close to their mouth or averting their eyes downwards just briefly or um, kind of closing up, crossing their legs, arm, arms over the chest. All of those are just little tells. But again, you gotta, uh, you have to study people. So if you study you know, the, the chapter on psychopaths and then you study the chapter on how to detect lies and um, you add it all up together and then you use kind of your intuition. You know, A lot of this depends on a person's, uh, uh, you, you gotta have a good sense of things. And so Hopefully this book, when you read through it, you'll get a lot of this information and it will help to develop your instinct because you're better off if you can internalize all this information and then you just have an instinct about people. I think you know what I'm talking about, Kathy, right? Oh, I do. I do. And, you know, when we're getting, um, you know, onto the chapter about, you know, I'm skipping ahead, anger and aggression, and you're talking about personal space. Um, one year I was out in Montana and I saw a moose and I decided to get close to it. And, you know, I could tell the minute I got into his personal space because he got very irritated. And so I just kind of, you know, gently backed away and then he was okay. So there yeah. is that, you know, and we all do have it. You know, it's like people say, you know, get out of my bubble. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, the uh, chapter on space and anger and aggression, again, it's a preventative chapter. What I wanted to do is like this. These are the signs that the people you are dealing with are trying to control their anger and that they're about to pop. <laughs> you know, that their um, their anger and aggressiveness is about to boil over and it might result in actual physical violence. And again, it's important to be able to read those body language and then. The strategy and, you know, to be honest with you, this chapter is, is something I've discussed a lot with uh, a friend of mine who is the uh, uh, head instructor for the police academy here. And he, he specifically trains in close combat uh, uh, training with the police officers. And he wrote a uh, essay, which unfortunately, and I'm, I'm not going to mention his name, but the essay was rejected by the police college because what he tried to do was teach officers to understand that when they're dealing with a mentally ill person on the verge of becoming violent, you have to be aware of their space. You know, so what happens with, with, with police and they see somebody that's mentally ill and it looks like they're going to lose it, they move into their space aggressively and then, boom, this triggers these guys into becoming violent. Immediately, it's, a, it's the fight and flight response. And if they had kept their space... And, it, you know, it's the same way uh, I, I tell people. It's like you deal when you uh, – the same tactic that you do, uh, use when you're walking in the woods and suddenly you come across a bear. You know, you don't invade their space. You step back slowly. You keep facing them. You speak calmly. You try to diffuse the situation. So the chapter on anger and aggression is to use that strategy. I mean, what, we want to fight people? You know, I've been in situations, I'm a big guy, and, and, and you know, I've been in, in pretty hairy parts of town all over the world, you know. Um, I could have gotten to a lot of trouble, but whenever I saw that kind of trouble, I mean, what am I going to do? I'm going to start throwing punches at people because they got a bad attitude. No, you know, I can diffuse the situation. I can talk myself out of anything. And isn't that better than resorting to violence? Uh, of course it is, because violence is always going to be an uncertain outcome. Uh, even if you win, what if you kill the guy, <laughs> you know? 
then you are going to be charged with murder. So in every situation, if you can read the, the person, you can read the situation, see when their symptoms are coming about that they're going to lose it and become violent, then diffuse it. You know, back away, speak calmly. Uh, I mean, I've avoided a lot of the fights by saying simply, look, I'll buy you a beer. We'll forget about it. You know, for three bucks for a beer, I have avoided violence and bloodshed and misery and visits to the hospital or lawsuits. You know, I can avoid all that by buying somebody a beer. However, you know, it's always good to have some training because if well, buying them a beer and doesn't work, then you still might have to take them down. Well, let's skip that into the preventing anger. What do you what do you mean when you say um, people should become like water? Well, that's again, it's a, a Chinese expression. I'm not sure if Sun Tzu used it so much. I'm pretty sure that Lao Tzu uh, or Lao Tzu in the uh, Tao Te Ching, um, the most, you know, the seminal work on uh, on Taoism, he was the one that always advocated becoming like water. And becoming like water means you avoid what is hard and you penetrate what is weak. So <clears throat> if I'm up against a big guy he's drunk he's getting violent and now he's directing his anger towards me i'm not going to stand right in front of that anger and take it i'm going to evade i'm going to move off but not necessarily backwards i'm going to move off at a slight angle um in a circular motion so he has to continually reposition himself to direct his anger towards me and i'll keep redirecting that because that's what water does i'll give you an example of how this works it's if you've ever tried to hold a beach ball underwater with one hand it's impossible it will always find a way of you know slipping out of your hand and popping back up to the surface this is the uh, principle of self-defense where you become like water where somebody directs their anger at you and let's say it does become violent you continue using that strategy because when they attack you, you evade the direct attack. But you kind of circle around in a, in a circular motion until you're beside them or behind them. So, you know, you're in a position of advantage then. So even if it does become a direct attack, you still use the same principle. And that is avoid what is hard. Now, attack what is weak. Um, you know, diffuse the system, uh, uh, diffuse the, the, the situation. So let's say they're angry at you because, well, I don't know, you parked your car in your parking spot. So, you know, go around that and say, OK, okay well, we're going to move the car and, um, you know, give me a few minutes. And, you know, you evade the, the, the confrontation. You're not going to say, well, I got there first or whatever or I didn't know. But, uh, you know, it, 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 you have to kind of be in this situation. It's the like being the bigger person out of the situation. And, it, it, you know, it's, it's you just do the right thing. Well, I, exactly. It is being the bigger person. And I'll be honest with you. I, you know, I'm a big guy and I've trained in martial arts for a long time and I don't need to prove anything. What does it matter to me if I say, you know, I'm sorry or sure, you're right. Let's, you know, let's forget about it. Let's go for a beer or why don't you go home to the wife and kids and, and uh, you know, sleep it off or whatever. Does, how does that affect me? It, it doesn't matter to me. What I'm doing is avoiding harming people. And, uh, you know, I have nothing to prove because I know myself. So to play the, the bigger man or kind of thing uh, to, uh, yeah, it's, there's a French expression called noblesse oblige which means if you are in a superior position, you are obliged to show kindness to people under you. So I'm a big guy. You know, I remember one time I was in uh, in a bar in Taipei and uh, I met some girl at the bar and some other guy came up and we started, he, he started arguing over the girl and uh, he said, let's step outside. And the problem was the guy was like, five foot five, you know, out of shape. I could have wiped that street with him with one arm tied behind my back. What am I going to do? Am I going to hurt this guy? No, I said, listen, you know what? Let's let her decide who she'd like to have a beer with. But meanwhile, 
I'm going to buy you a beer and we'll just call it a night, okay? And so that's what happened. Because what? You know, I, I'm in this superior position. He didn't know about my training or anything like that. And I could tell, like I said, when you when you train a lot, you can tell people by their body language. I knew this guy couldn't be able to defend himself at all. I guess he was a little bit drunk and he was full of himself and he and he thought if he picked a fight or something, it would make him look better. Whatever. You know, do I care? I just didn't want to hurt this guy for no good reason. And so I avoided it. All right. I'm back, too. OK. Um, you also give some techniques on how to help people calm down from their fear. Oh, uh, overcoming fear. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, fear and anger, you know, it's um, the thing is to displace the energy that fear and anger build up. Um, so basically you just you need to read them, too, because there are some physiological signs, you know, uh, uh, there's a time when they start to turn white when they're red. People, when they get angry, they first get flushed. And this is the uh, flight and uh, fight and flight response kicking in. It kicks in what they call the uh, sympathetic nervous system. The uh, the breathing gets heavy. Person starts to sweat. Uh, there's more oxygen being uh, distributed into the bloodstream. Uh, the adrenals the adrenals start to produce adrenaline to uh, you know increase the efficiency of uh, using sucrose in, in, in the muscle tissue so that they can you know they'll become stronger. <clears throat> At this stage in their anger, it's, you know, um, they're not ready to attack you yet. And what happens then is the this heightened state of arousal can only last so long. And then the parasympathetic system kicks in. And I, I explain all that in the book, too. Uh, and what the parasympathetic system does is reverse all the uh, 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 the build up to violence that the sympathetic system has triggered. But there is this kind of balancing point and it's at that balance point that they might suddenly attack and become violent so that's the point where you have to step back 10 feet all right i'm back sorry did you yeah. even know i was gone no <laughs> <laughs> i i've had twice i've had um my internet dropped and thank god you oh. just talked right through it didn't even know i was gone i just got back online again I mean, it's crazy I've never had um, been knocked off so much in one show. I mean, my goodness, people don't want us to talk about the art of urban survival. Mm, yeah, well, oh, it's happened. Yeah, well, whoever the censors are, remember, guys, karma is a bitch. Trust me. Karma return. Ooh, doggy. Okay, so <laughs> moving along, because I really don't know what you were talking about, because I was knocked offline. Uh, well, I, I'd gone over some of the signs and symptoms when uh, uh, a person uh, loses it. Okay. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I think you're gone again. Are you gone again, Kathy? All right. Uh, continue on, Stefan. Uh, she's really having some issues tonight with her spike. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, I've been listening and enjoying the conversation. Uh, Do we have any uh, questions in the, in the well, chat room? Well, you were talking about how to, you were talking about how to recognize signs of anger in a person, and I think about the time you got to when somebody first gets angry and they're flushed and red, and then they turn white. Is that when they're getting ready to just explode all right i'm back you and are, she's back <laughs> skype is giving you up and down tonight isn't it it seems to be god must be a new sensor well it's going to be sucked to be him i think so um where were we stefan you just i might as well call it your show tonight huh I guess. Uh, <laughs> you're a very, you are a very good conversationalist, Stefan, and you don't wait to be asked pointed questions. You just keep going, and that's excellent. Since we're having some issues tonight. Yeah, I guess yeah. it works well for me, huh? Well, I'll mute uh, and let you go back to it. Okay, so let's talk about street smarts. 
Yeah, so well, all of these things contribute to street smarts. So there's a chapter on street smarts. And again, all these chapters are very short and to the point. Uh, you know, I don't go into a lot of verbiage. Again, I wanted it to be like a, a Boy Scout manual. This is what you need to know. This is how it works. And now we've moved on to the next lesson. So street smarts, you know, I grew up in um, the worst neighborhood of Toronto. And uh, I later on became a uh, what's known as a detached street worker. In the same neighborhood, um, I, I had a partner who was uh, shorter than me with curly black hair, and they used to call us Starsky and Hutch, if you remember the old series. You know? Yes. <laughs> because I was tall and blonde, and he was short and curly haired. And anyways, we, you know, there is street smarts is uh, just a kind of a cynical attitude, basically. You know, like whatever happens on the street is because somebody wants something and i know it, it it's bad to uh, it, it's not a pleasant way to go through life thinking that everybody that's talking to you or everybody that comes up to you is after something but well, that's what street smarts are you know you can't you have to have a very cynical and nihilistic kind of attitude if you're going to survive in a bad neighborhood and that's all there's to it so if you combine all of the knowledge in that first few chapters, you know, what, how psychopaths work, how, uh, when to tell when people are angry or being deceptive, um, <clears throat> how to tell when they're lying to you. Now you add to it kind of an overall cynical attitude and you've got a pretty good street sense because what happens with my, my, my students that I was training is that, okay, they can, learn how to escape from a grab or somebody gets them a choke hold, how to get out of it. That's fine. But street smarts is to not get into that situation to begin with. And so you have to be able to, you know, do things like read what the street is doing, uh, you know, based on like graffiti and uh, the type of neighborhood you're in and what other people are doing. You know, for example, uh, most people, when they get lost in a bad neighborhood, they go somewhere where there's lights and they stand underneath the lights, you know, because they, they feel they're safer there because there's a light. Uh, actually, that's the worst thing you can do. You're just, you know, putting out a sign. Look at me. I'm ready to be a victim. You stick to the shadows, you know, and uh, you stick to the side of the streets. You don't walk down the middle of the street. So all those you know, uh, strategies are part of being street smart. Um, let's see so much time we have. Um, how can um, what should a person have in their car emergency kit? What are some well, of the I, things? I well, for uh, I recommend people have a, a bunch of emergency kits. For example, I have one, two, three, three emergency kits. And um, then in addition to my emergency kit, I've got a very good first aid kit and a communications kit. So let me talk with the, about the simplest for, uh, emergency kit, and that is a pocket kit. <coughs> Excuse me. I do a lot of bicycling, and uh, I love to explore cities that I uh, that I'm living in or visiting by bicycle because it's it's fast enough to cover a lot of distance, but it's slow enough that you can see everything that's going on in the city. And so I've I've bicycled through you know just about every city that I've, I've visited and and got to know it really well. But I will carry a small kit. Um, it's about the size of a. Um, of a of a what do you call those uh, uh, <clears throat> a candy tin you know three inches by five inches uh, by an inch and a half thick and I have some equipment in there um, like a tools a uh, small flashlight I have uh, just in case you get a headache I've got uh, you know a couple of aspirin and some ibuprofen I have a small first aid kit in there. Um, and I have a, uh, a small Leatherman tool, which is uh, which is like a pliers which you attach with that. And I keep that all in a small kit. I also I have a uh, bicycle uh, uh, a uh, bicycle chain repair kit uh, and also a uh, flat tire kit. And those things have saved my life many times. You know, I've been in a bad neighborhood, like I was bicycling through a bad part of Oakland, California one time. And, uh, you know, I got a flat tire. And uh, right at the same time I got the flat tire, there was uh, 
uh, the lights started going out and uh, it started getting dark. And little did I know that all the gas stations and everything would close down at six o'clock. And so there I was sort of in a deserted part of the town with uh, the lights going out and everything closing down. And I was miles away from home, but I had my kit and uh, I was able to patch the tire and, uh, and get back on the road. It took me about 10 minutes, you know. Uh, but if I had to walk through that neighborhood, I would have been in danger, you know. So I have my personal kit, and I take that with me uh, whenever I go bicycling. Then I have a kit that I keep in the car, and it's a little bit more... There's a bit more in that kit. It's bigger because I don't have to carry it in my pocket or in my backpack. I can carry it in the back of the car. And in that kit, I have things that I need in case the car breaks down. Like I have a a, a tool kit. So I've got sockets and, and, and uh, wrenches. So, you know, if something goes on, you know, I'm pretty handy with my uh, around machinery. I could probably fix it or at least try to fix it, you know. Um, then I've got like road flares and uh, emergency blanket. I've got extra uh, water, extra oil for the uh, for the engine, extra uh, um, uh, windshield wiper fluid. I've got extra antifreeze. I've got uh, because I live in Canada, I'll keep a bag of rock salt in the back uh, in case I get stuck uh, and I need to get out of a ditch or something like that. Um, ropes and a wench a wench is great to carry in the car because if you ever get pulled over or uh, you ever get stuck in the side of the ditch or uh, uh, you have an accident you go off the road and you're stuck there uh, a wench can get you out in, in, in 15 minutes you know so those are the types of things I, I also have uh, you know, of course flashlights I think I mentioned uh, emergency blankets but also uh, a good pair of shoes an extra hat extra gloves and an extra jacket. And again, because, you know, I live in Canada and um, the temperatures can get pretty cold here. So in case you get stranded in your car, um, you know, I've got some extra warm clothes. I've got some good shoes. And especially for women, carry a pair of running shoes in your car at all times because women wear, you know, the nice shoes when they're going to the office. But what if suddenly, you know, you're on the side of the road and uh, the weather turns bad and you have to walk, you know, five miles to to uh, get to a gas station or, or to find, uh, find oh, some help. Then oh, they, they did, you need uh, the running shoes. Did, I, I know, right. and I wish the writers of Jurassic Park would have heard you. Did you ever see the last <laughs> movie? They had that yeah. woman, the star, running in high heels. I mean, uh, this woman, she amazed me. She is right Can up there do? with Ginger Rogers. I mean, me she do? never lost yeah. a heel. No. I mean, come <laughs> You know, I mean, she didn't need running shoes. I'm, I'm just, I was amazed. But now all of this is common sense. I, mean, you, I want to travel with you, Stefan. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like you don't have to bring everything. He's got it all. You know, he comes with accessories. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's you think it's a lot, but it, it's not really like uh, my pocket kit literally fits in my pocket. And I've got everything in there I've, I've got. To, uh, in case I get a headache or, you know, a couple of times I banged up the bike and I, I cut myself and at least I had band-aids there. I could stop the bleeding, you know. Um, with the car kit, it's really not that much. It it all fits into uh, um, like a kind of like a carry-on bag, not even a full backpack. I'm just talking about a little, little satchel bag. Everything fits in there <coughs> and it takes up hardly any room. It, in terms of money, well, my pocket kit, what maybe thirty bucks I spent for, if you include everything uh, for the car kit maybe sixty bucks eighty bucks but you know these are things that can save your life and and I I've used all my kits I've always had you know throughout my life some time that I'm glad I had that kit because it really helped for the situation I was in and then of course I have my home emergency kit which now is. Uh, probably the biggest kit, and that fits into a, a backpack. And I keep that in the closet, and uh, it's got everything I need so that if I had to get out of my apartment or my house and I had to, like, you know, evacuate and I had, you know, minutes to do it, let's say, you know, the radio announcer comes on, there's a, um, you know, in, in your case there in Hawaii, there's a uh, tsunami heading. You've got, uh, you know, 20 minutes to get uh, 15 miles away from the coast. 
well, you've got that kit, you grab it out of the closet, you throw it in your car, and boom, you're gone. Or if you can't use your car, then you've got that kit, you throw it on your backpack, and you run like hell. Uh, but at least you'll have everything you need to survive for about three days. I've got three days worth of water, three days worth of food. I've got walkie-talkies. I've got emergency radios, flashlights, uh, shelter, uh, first aid kit. Did I mention the first aid kit? Um and uh, also security. I've got a knife well, in what, there. You know. What kind of food do you have in it? I've got just the condensed uh, uh, emergency rations. It's like a, it's kind of like peanut butter chocolate. It's very dense and it's high in calories. And you know, look, it's not something you'd want to eat. But uh, if you've ever fasted for you know four days. Um, you know what it's like. You you know anything will taste good, and you need the calories, especially in an emergency situation, because you're going to be nervous. You're going to be, it's, you know, it's not just the fear, but it's the anxiety and it's the pressure and and having to think fast and move fast and lift things and get out of the way, and you're burning through calories like crazy, and uh, you you know you'll end up with low blood sugar in no time at all and suddenly i mean you might mentally be prepared to do this that and the other but your knees have given out on you you can't stand you can't walk you can hardly do things there's a there's this really awful uh, um, um, weakness that comes about when you are suddenly deprived of enough calories to run your body so even though you know it doesn't taste great uh, it doesn't matter because what you need to do is provide cash to your body so you can continue doing and uh, continue uh, to survive. So that's okay. what I got. Now, you were also talking about um, a little um, um, kit that you had for communication. So where would one get a handheld CB radio? Oh, they're, they're easy to find. They're, you can buy them online. And the price for them has gone down quite a bit with this whole, uh, you know, offshoring and uh, manufacturing electronic products in China. Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be, uh, you know, 20 years ago, it would cost you, you know, 300 bucks for half decent CB. But now you can buy it for like 50 bucks, 60 bucks. And um, <clears throat> I don't recommend the CB as much. Like, it's okay. It's better than nothing. But um, they now have these very small, very lightweight ham radios that uh, broadcast and receive on FM and uh, and um, shortwave and um, FM radio. And these are good because <clears throat> you could call for help. Their range isn't that great, but <clears throat> uh, you might be picked up by local uh, ham radio operators or maybe a, a – a relay station, but most important is that you can listen into ham radio broadcasts and you can hear, uh, for example, my ham radio, I have it uh, tuned into the uh, what's called the uh, emergency trunk line. So I can hear the crosstalk, meaning the, you know, the communications between ambulances and fire departments and and uh, police departments and their, you know, uh, their home bases. And I can hear what's going on. And that gives you a much better picture of, uh, of what's really going on than if you were to rely on FM broadcasts. For example, um, about three years ago, we had a brief thunder shower here in Toronto, but it dropped like six inches in 45 minutes. It flooded the subways, it flooded a couple of the highways, it closed down public transport, it flooded one of the big uh, transformer stations, the power went out in the city, and with the power, strangely enough, all the cell phones came down too. So now, I turn on the FM radio, because I have one of those emergency FM radio, AM FM radios, you know, with the crank, and I'm, I'm listening to local radio stations. Now, we are without power uh, already for half an hour and still not a word from any of the radio stations about what's going on or what's happening. And I said, well, you know, screw this. I'm taking out the ham radio. And I tuned into the trunk line. And within five minutes, I knew exactly what was going on. I knew which highways were flooded. I knew why the, uh, the public transport was uh, shut down. I knew why the uh, um, um, 
the power went out. I knew that the ambulances were all busy rescuing people trapped in elevators. I knew there was a search and rescue party going on for people that were nearby one of the creeks that suddenly flooded and washed them all the way down the creek. So getting a ham radio and keeping that as part of your emergency kit is really really important because you can find out what's really going on. Uh, the next door neighbor said um, they were planning on evacuating. They wanted to go to see their friends and um, they're going to go along this highway. And I said, well, actually that highway has been closed off because I just heard the dispatcher uh, requesting a couple of cruisers to uh, rope off the exit and on ramps to that highway because that was one of the highways that got flooded by this freakish flash flood. So, now they know don't go that way because you would have been trapped in traffic for the next six hours because they just shut down the city. So, the, you know, again, the same with what I talked about in the, in the early part of the book about being able to anticipate and read the situation is really important because then you can make predictions what's going to happen. So a good communication system uh, and knowing how to use it and be, is, is essential to figuring out what the situation is and then you can predict it and, and, and uh, uh, figure out strategies to survive it. We also talk about um, dealing with the police, which I really find very interesting. And, you well, know, teaching people how to deal with them. Sure, because police are a threat too. You know, you're dealing with men that are armed. And my rule you know, is, is when you're dealing with armed men, you have to be careful because, you know, mistakes can suddenly become fatal. You know, two guys in a bar, they disagree about something. The worst can happen, one guy throws a punch. Uh, at least back in the old days. Nowadays, everybody's carrying something. You never know. But with police departments, well, you know, they're armed and they might be nervous and they might have had a bad day. And uh, you might do something again, like what we talked about earlier. You might be invading their space. And then when you invade their space and they're already nervous, you know, they might start shooting. So uh, it's important to understand all the threats in a society and uh, police you know, I have members in the police forces. They're good guys. Uh, most of them are really good people. Every once in a while, you're going to get a rotten one. And how can you tell? How can you tell when the, you know, the flashing lights behind you pulls you over on a uh, secluded stretch of road and, uh, and you're a woman by yourself that uh, this is one of the sheepdogs, you know, one of the guys that's pretty good or whether he's a predator. He could be a psychopath, too, because a lot of psychopaths like to become police because of the power of being a police officer. And we've seen over history, over the course of time, hundreds if not thousands of cases where police officers were you know, serial rapists, ran organized crime gangs, dealt drugs, smuggled drugs, smuggled arms. Uh, you know, so you can't tell. So when you're being pulled over, you don't know what you're dealing with. Hopefully it's one of the good guys. Chances are it's going to be one of the good guys. But every now and then, uh, it's not going to be one of the good guys. And so you have to know how to behave around them so that you don't give this guy an, uh, an excuse to shoot you. That's as simple as that. Um. You know, how do you feel? Now, you wrote this book a little. It's, it's not that old, but it is old. But it was written before the Patria um, went into effect. So how do you protect yourself? And, and what advice do you give to people because of the Patria? You know, they can do anything they want now, the police. Um, yeah, my advice is always to uh, never get pulled over. You know, just don't. You have to kind of play <laughs> the game, man. <laughs> well, you know, I, I do the workshops, and uh, I tell this story in the workshop because uh, you know, it works for me. I, I take advantage of uh, people's expectations. For example, I have a coat that I wear. Hear that? I do. Where's that coming from? Oh, okay. <clears throat> and, and you're gone. I'm here. Oh, you're there? Oh, okay. I think so. Oh, you can hear me. <laughs> yeah. And so is the hit. That's the static back. Um, 
Yeah, so you try to avoid uh, drawing attention to yourself. For example, you know, when I drive, I always drive the speed limits. You know, I have old ladies pass me and give me the finger on highways. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, I don't care. It's just like we went back to the other, you know, story about being in the bar and saying, you know, do I care? I don't care. I'm avoiding getting a speeding ticket, but more importantly, I'm avoiding being pulled over by the police, which means there's a greater chance of me being shot or arrested. Um, so I drive the speed limit, you know, I'm right on it all the time. Also, you know, I keep my car up to date, you know, make sure there's no lights out or anything like that. I'm not, you know, I don't give them an excuse to pull me over. So you, you, you know, you kind of fit in and you blend in. Now, the other thing I do is because I'm, a, I'm a big guy and I sort of look like a cop or a fireman or something like that already. What I do is I wear a bright red jacket with my, uh, uh Kung Fu, uh, crest on my uh, over my breast pocket now my kung fu school's crest sort of looks like a police badge or something like that it's got a dragon on it but it's also got a shield but when you stand 10 feet away it looks like a cop's badge and i did that on purpose because it's part of the disguise i'm not imitating a police officer but if you stood 20 feet away from me and you had to guess what i was you would think i was a police officer i do that on purpose i also have this bright red coat that i wear which looks like the kind of coat that a fireman or an emergency responder would wear and on my left shoulder pad i also you know sewed on a couple of my uh, st john ambulance patches now when i sit in the driver's seat in your cop and you pull up to the left side of me and you take a look over uh you see a guy in a red coat that looks like he's got some sort of official patches hello yeah sometimes it sometimes that might be me anyways no no it's not, um. no, not me Keep anyway, talking. so uh, <laughs> so you know, is the cop going to pull me over? I look like uh, you know one of them kind of thing, and so uh, uh, you know, the chances are they're going to pass me by and look for somebody that looks more suspicious. Yeah, that's the chance, you know. Um, but then on the other hand, I go to you know kind of a bad part of town. Uh, <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, hello. We are trying to get Kathy back. There seems to be all kinds of Skype issues on her end tonight. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have been talking to Stefan. Uh, remember, folks, Revolution Radio is a listener-supported station. Your donations are very important to us. If you want to make a donation, go to the home page, find the donate button. Any amount is appreciated. We also have uh, seeds. You can buy seeds for the coming spring, or if you want to store them, they will keep up in the freezer for 20 years. They are non-GMO. We got the giant seed box today for ourselves. And there's not anything I can think of except maybe pole beans that I did not find in that box. There's T-shirts, coffee mugs, all kinds of things. Uh, we are talking with Stefan. Stefan, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. I cannot get Kathy back. Um, I Let's told see. her to try to call in. I've tried to drag her in. That's not working. Um she did oh, change her wireless today, so I don't know if that is the issue or not. But uh, I told her to see if she. I think she's back in. on. No, she's not. She's not on. Let me see. There we go. I'm trying to call her now. Maybe the kinks. Well, I've lost everybody. I, I'm still here. Oh, okay. All right, man, this is nuts. <laughs> she, I can't drag her in, and it won't even let me call her. My goodness. Well, um, I guess we can get back to what you were talking about. 
you were uh, talking about the importance of having a um, – wow, I've lost everybody. Uh, I, I'm still here. Oh, okay. It said you – I'll, I'll, just, I'll just continue and then um, whenever Kathy is able to get on, then we'll just uh, – because I, I can see here whether she's trying to get on or not. Oh, okay. Anyway, so the the, the point of um, you know learning there's a chapter on uh, how to deal with the police, and it's aimed at avoiding a lot of the you know unnecessary police shootings that we see these videos of. For example, you know you're being pulled over in the car, and uh, the police officer is nervous. Remember, they're from their point of view, most of the shootings occur when they walk up beside some guy in the car and that guy pulls a gun and shoots him. So they're always the most nervous, even more scared than you are when they're walking up behind you. So rather than, you know, make those police officers more nervous, if you can, you know, again, what we talked about earlier with the, you know, reducing the aggression and, 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 and dissipating or uh, uh, you know, reducing the uh, uh, the tension. Well, same thing with the police. You, what you want to do with the police is reduce their fear so that they don't feel the need to pull out a gun and shoot you. And whether it's right or wrong doesn't matter because, you know, this is a life and death situation now. So in the book, I recommend that if you're pulled over, turn on your dome light uh, so that they can see who's in the car. They're always, you know, they can't necessarily see from the back if there's a bunch of people in there. And uh, so they don't know what they're walking up on. If you turn on the dome light, they're better able to look inside the car and see who's there. And again, that reduces the police officer's fear. And that's what we want to do. Remember, they have guns. You don't want to make them up nervous <laughs> and twitchy. Uh, the second thing you do is you keep your hands on the steering wheel and you don't get out of the car. Now, this is opposite the kind of information I was given when I was young. Uh, and those days they told you always, well, if you're pulled over, get out of the car, walk up to the police officer. That way he can see you. And uh, and also you you know equalize the the power ratio between you and the cop. He's not looking down on you in your in your seat. You're now eye to eye with him. But it turns out this information was wrong. And so the correct thing to do is stay in your car because when they see you get out of the car right away, they think you're coming to attack them. So again, we want to just you know calm them down. Mm -hmm. So you stay in the car. You, you keep your hands on the steering wheel so they can see your hands. You don't reach into the uh, glove compartment. You don't reach under the seat. You don't reach into the side compartment because they think you're going for a gun and then they will shoot you. So it's basic information, basic advice, and it's meant to keep everybody happy and safe, you know. Um, so – and and this, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a criminal or you're not a criminal. They can't tell when they pull you over. So, and the same as you can't tell when, you know, what kind of a cop is going to come up to you. So the, the more you can do to dissuade the situation. I mean, you know, I, there's a part of me, I don't want to be pulled over. I don't want to have to answer for something I didn't do. I don't want to be interrogated. I don't want to feel threatened by the authority of the law. Um, but there's no alternative. You can't, you know, run. You can't fight them. So best thing to do, calm the situation down. So that's on, on police stops. And also on uh, uh, the chapter on police also deals with you know, secret police. Uh, by secret police, I mean all of the alphabet agencies that don't go around with a badge on the outside of their uniform. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that chapter, I give the example. For example, let's say you're um, – a group of uh, naturalists and um, you want to protest, um, you know, the cutting of some trees in a local park. Uh, so you would think, you know, there's nothing harmful about uh, uh, people like that. Often they're made up of middle-aged housewives. And, uh, and um, so why would uh, you have to be concerned about uh, keeping operational security um, within your group? Uh, but it turned out there are cases where undercover police officers have actually infiltrated such an organization to spy on them because they posed a threat to a big corporation that wanted to appropriate that land for some, you know, uh, exploitation for their natural minerals. So even if you think you're an uh, above board, uh, unsuspicious, outstanding, honest 
law-abiding citizen does not mean you won't be targeted by secret police. So there's exactly. A, 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 <laughs> <laughs> we see evidence of that every day here in the states. Yeah, um, you know, for example, I saw that video there where they they, they did the raid on the uh, on the Whole Foods uh, where they were giving uh, unpasteurized milk. You know, and, and here they come in like it's a SWAT team. You know, they're raiding, you know, a mom and pop. Uh, mom and pop farm that sells unpasteurized milk, and these guys are swinging in off of helicopters and running around with their guns raised, as if, as if they're going to be attacked by you know uh, terrorist forces. I mean, it was just ridiculous the overreaction to it. But that's the way things are now. Uh, Kathy mentioned about um, you know the, since the Patriot Act has anything changed? Well, no, even more reason to uh, be careful around police forces. Look. You know, most of them are okay, and we we hope they're on the side of good. But the way things have been hyped up with, you know, this phony war on drugs and the phony war on terrorism, they've got everybody nervous and twitchy, and then you've got the police forces nervous and twitchy, where, you know, even to arrest somebody for, you know, jaywalking, they they send in a SWAT team with the guns raised. So, look, you got to know how to deal now with that situation and defuse it and do everything you can to make sure nobody has a reason to pull triggers. And that's part of the book as well. <laughs> kind of like in the Old West, no sudden moves. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Again, like I, I, I say, it's like dealing with a wild bear that you run across in the woods. You know, no sudden movements, no, uh, you know, back off, be quiet, you know, um, talk reassuringly, you know, uh, good bear, good bear, good bear. And um, because accidents happen and, and again the book is just meant to provide the kind of basic information to keep people alive in those kind of situations that can occur in an urban environment and yeah police stops pulls overs if uh, they're knocking on a door they're banging into your door they're breaking down the door to do a police raid uh, maybe they got the wrong address they think you're you know Colombian cocaine dealers or something like that how many times has that happened oh you my know? gosh uncountable uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, you're sitting on the couch and you go for the remote control or something to turn down the, the, the sound on the TV set and they think you're going for a gun and boom. I mean, these are real incidences that really happen and people were killed because of things like that. So uh, that's why it's good to know how to handle all these different situations. Well, going back to uh, the body language, now, um, if you are confronted with someone, is it? better to maintain an eye contact or not no eye contact is a universal sign of aggression uh, for example you don't stare at a bear in the eye either because they will assume that that's a, a an act of aggression same thing with people um, they don't like direct eye contact now that doesn't mean you should avoid their eyes you need to make some contact with their eyes but don't stare so you kind of glance at their eyes. So what I recommend is that you look at the tip of their nose. So this way you're not really looking into their eyes, but from their perspective you are, but it's not quite as menacing. And then, again, don't stare, but don't keep your eyes inverted the whole time either because now it looks like you're you're hiding something. So you have to kind of balance it. You look in their eyes a little bit and then you look off to the side. That way you establish uh, you know, an equality, you know, I am looking you at in the eye, I recognize you as a person. For example, if you're dealing with like, you know, some of those crazy schizophrenic people that, that are homeless and that you're walking down the street and uh, they all love me, they see me a mile away. As soon as I start walking down the street, they're ready to talk to me, you know. Um, so if you were to avoid their gaze entirely, you're not recognizing their existence and now they're suddenly even more agitated. So what I would do is I would look at them and I would speak to with them, but again, don't stare, and then I would move on. And 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 it's the same thing, you know, with with uh, aggressive people in a bar or or dealing with the police. Um, you don't want to not acknowledge their existence by not looking at them at all, and yet you don't want to signal that you're being aggressive by staring at them. So. Happy medium between the two would be the best way to go. So you just kind of have to use your own judgment. And because uh, yeah. I've been in a few situations 
where maintaining the eye contact helped me avoid a fight. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, you're, you're, you know, it's, it's an act of aggression. Now, most conflicts, interspecies conflicts, is uh, resolved through what's called uh, threat display behavior. Um, so, for example, you know, two roosters meet each other. Uh, the first thing they do is they hackle up their, their feathers, hackle up, and they, you know, the wings come out and they start posturing. And a lot of the time, it won't come to actual blows. It's rather whoever appears more threatening tends to intimidate the other one into backing down. And the same thing happens with people. And, you know, it's hard to, you know, provide a general rule for how to react in every situation, but definitely in some situations you need to have a counter threat display because if you appear too much like a victim, then you're encouraging more abuse or more aggression to be directed towards you. So you have to use a counter threat. <coughs> and that counter threat could be a firm glance in their eye and telling them and w with the expression on your face and the mental attitude that, okay, <clears throat> I've been about as nice as I can be with you and you're just about to step over the line and then I'm going to have to deal with you. And if you give them that look, and you know the kind of look I mean, right? I know exactly the kind of look you mean. Apparently, I'm pretty good at it. That's a great talent to have. You know, you give them that look and then and they'll back down, you know. And so, again, that's you got to balance these things. You know, you have to take into account a lot of factors. Are they armed? Are they mentally unstable? Are they on drugs? You know, because a lot of these things won't work if they're, you know, on meth or they're Very on crank true. or something like that. Very true. Right? So, you know, a tactic that would work well with a sane person who's just having a bad day won't work with somebody who's just, you know, strung out on drugs. And now, now you're giving them that look, and that's a challenge to them. And now they have to answer that challenge by beating your head in with a pipe. You so know? that, that so, would be when you would walk softly and be very pleasant and just try to sidestep and, and evade them, correct? Yeah, you know, and, and it's all part of reading them. And I'm hoping that, you know, when you read that whole first section of the book all about the psychopaths and the body language and what anger and aggression is and territoriality and in people's personal space and comfort zones and, and reading them uh, in the street smarts and, uh, you know, dealing with crazy people, you need to develop a sense of things. And you, to be honest with you, you can't really read it and learn it from a book. Now, the book will give you the background information, but you then have to combine it with your own life experience and make it a part of you. And then once it's a part of you, you don't need to remember what the advice of the book is because you'll be going on instinct. So you'll be able to tell the situation and you'll be able to deal with it and handle it. And that's what I'm hoping you know, and that's why I wrote the book is to uh, give people, you know, a, a bigger picture of what, you know, the dynamics of a threatening or dangerous situation are, not just, you know, here's a tool and use it. So somebody does this right away, punch them in the face or, um, you know, there's a there's a, 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 a <clears throat> tsunami coming right away, get in the car and run away. You know, it doesn't always work that way, but instead. It has to be internalized, and you have to develop your own sense of street smarts and then a touch of instinct and intuition, and you're good to go. Well, now, um, I have always believed that it's very important not to look like a victim. If you're walking, you should have erect posture, uh, continuously scanning your surroundings, and, you know, uh, look like you're not an easy victim. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, they did studies uh, of criminals and they, they, they had them you know, fill out questionnaires. They went to the prisons and uh, asked them to describe the kind of people that they would attack and um, what they were looking for and potential victims. And what they're looking for is people that are distracted and um, not paying attention and that project a body language that uh, suggests that they would not fight back. Again, like I said earlier, I can tell a lot by a person by the way they walk, and so can criminals. And um, they did a study for women that had taken a self-defense course, 
And what they found was that women, once they had taken a self-defense course, were far less likely to be uh, attacked. And the reason they figured it out was that uh, why that would be was because once you had some training, you had a little bit more confidence in yourself. And that confidence uh, manifested itself in your body language. Again, you know, your mental attitude is is directly linked to your physical body as well. Uh, you know, you know, if you're nervous and anxious all the time, you're going to get sick. You'll come down with more colds and flus. Uh, if you're worried and panic, um, you know, you're more susceptible to things like diabetes and cancer. And uh, so if you feel confidence in yourself that, you know, if something happened, you have some strategies, you have, you know, a plan of what to do, that also manifests itself in your body language and so what they these studies showed was or what they deduced from these studies is that the women that did take a self-defense course simply walked better you know and so <laughs> you know they had more of a swagger to them they exactly like you said you keep your head up you know you scan your environment i do that all the time I scan it you know i'm like I'm i do like, too you know, i always have I've I always have to, to instill that in my girls' heads. Oh, yeah. Don't be yeah. on the cell phone texting. Know where you Thank are. You. Know who's around you. If you have, Know if there's a safe spot close by in case you have to make a run for it. You know, know where yeah. you can go. Yep, yeah, exactly. I'm glad you're teaching that to the girls because that is your premier self-defense technique because what you want to do is uh, – what they found was that you know potential predators will size a person up like that. Are they scanning their environment? Because uh, the element of surprise is a huge strategic uh, uh, advantage. So for a criminal, they want to catch somebody by surprise because now the advantage is, is on their side, you know. And uh, if it looks like they can't catch you by surprise, they would tend to ignore that person and wait for somebody else to come by that ha does have their nose in the, in the goddamn iPhones. I, I hate those things. I think they suck the life out of people. By all means, do not drive and use those things and or walk down the street with your head stuck in one and not see what's going on because you're just inviting an attack that way. I mean, they're completely oblivious as to what's going around them. And that's what criminals look for, you know. I'm going to send Kathy a message and see if she's trying to call. But, uh, yeah, I think what you're saying, a lot of it is common sense, but so many people anymore don't seem to have any common sense. Yeah, we always say it's common sense, but it's actually not common at all. You know, that... <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Um no, I see that around me all the time. I mean, I can tell, you know, uh, they are so, uh, you know, it's a good thing I'm not a criminal because it would have been so easy to, you, you could probably just walk up and take their purse. They wouldn't even notice. I, or, you know, slip away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just keep I walking. I know. Up. You know, that's something that I always do too is I always have a good hand on my purse. You know, or if I have an own shopping cart, I have my arm looped through the strap so nobody can just grab it and run. Yeah. And it's little things like that that uh, can be extremely helpful to you in the long run. Uh, Kathy just left a message that said a bad rainstorm right now. That could be what's been affecting her sky. So uh, I hope you don't mind uh, finishing the show with me. No, no, no problem. <laughs> Doing a good job. Do you have a website? Yeah, I have a website. It's um, www. Of course, everything is uh, chinastrategies.com. It's a weird name. You know, I got the website back in 1998 when my first book came out. And, uh, you know, everybody said, oh, get a website and, for your book. I said, okay, China Strategies is my first book. So, uh, but I just kept adding everything to that original website because I didn't want to maintain dozens of different websites, one for exactly. every book. Exactly. And, all, you know, and so. uh, where are your books available? Can you get them on Amazon? 
Yeah, they're on Amazon, they're on Kindle, they're on Smashwords, and uh, a couple of them are even audiobooks. Uh, 36 Strategies is an audiobook, and uh, Blind Zen, if you have anyone with a vision impairment, uh, it's a great book for them because it teaches uh, blind people how to use uh, um, self-defense, but also um, how to improve the other senses, sense of touch, sense of smell, sense of direction, using a bunch of um, you know uh, Zen meditation techniques and yeah. exercises. Uh, yeah, yeah. One of my grandmothers was blind, and uh, it was amazing. She she cooked. Um, she could drop something on the floor and could reach right down and pick it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just amazing. Yeah, and I'm thinking, uh, and, and since I wrote that book, I've been in touch with uh, blind martial artists from all over the world, and it's amazing what they can still do, you know. Uh, and I'm thinking also of the veterans that may have lost their sight during, during uh, you know, combat, and uh, they're still young men, and, uh, you know, they feel that their manhood is uh, gone with their sight, but uh, there is a lot of hope that they can uh, uh, still be a strong a forceful and powerful person in this world, you know. Exactly, um, exactly. I also um, had another blind relative, and he knew people by their hands. And it didn't matter how many years it had been since he'd seen you. He could take your hand, and he knew exactly who you were. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite people is uh, Helen Keller, and uh, she was just, what a remarkable individual, and my my favorite quote from her is, there is no certainty in life, uh, any sense of security is an illusion, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all, and, you know, She's right. She she is a very good person uh, as a role model because not only was she blind, she was also deaf and couldn't speak. So, and yeah. look what she made of herself. Unbelievable! What an inspiration. And uh, interesting, uh, <clears throat> she wrote about her sense of smell became very highly attuned, and she could smell people's personalities. And I researched this as well, and, and um, a, a great source of information came from Oliver Sacks. I don't know if you've heard of him. He was a neurologist, and he's famous for his book, uh, The Awakenings. They made a movie out of it with that. I did uh, see the movie, but uh, I wasn't familiar with the doctor's name. Yeah, uh, Dr. Oliver Sacks, and he wrote a book called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And now, I did looked, read that book. Yeah, isn't that a great the, book? The title was so eye-catching. I'm like, I have to read this book. Yeah. And so you remember the story about the guy who had the uh, tumor on his olfactory nerve, and he was suddenly able to smell everything? He, the man who could smell like a dog? Remember that chapter? No. I, I mean, it's been probably 20 years since yeah, I've read yeah, that book. Yeah, it's been 20 years. I, I, the reason I came back to it was when I was writing my book on blind Zen and trying to understand how to develop those senses so that they can, you know, compensate somewhat for the loss of vision. And uh, in the chapter, the man who uh, could smell like a dog, uh, this guy woke up one day. He had a dream that he was a dog. <laughs> and the next morning he woke up and he could smell everything. He could smell what uh, what a playing card was, the suit and number of a playing card by the amount of red and black ink on the playing card. Wow. He could smell when somebody was about to ask him a question. He could smell you know, a person's personality, whether they were nervous or happy or sad. He could smell what they've eaten and, and where they've been. And um, eventually he lost it, that sense of smell. The tumor grew bigger. And it uh, and, and and his smell went away completely. But for that two years or so, I think that he had it. He was able. He said his world revolved around the sense of smell. And so Helen Keller says the same thing. She tells of being able to go into a house and smelling the layers of smells of all the people that lived in that house before, over the you know preceding fifty to a hundred years. 
and the personalities of all the people that had lived there. And when she wrote about that, it was sort of like a really you know, outrageous claim. How could you smell the personalities of people that had lived in a house 20 years ago? But then you read Oliver Sacks and, 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 and those cases were, were through some neurological dysfunction. Some they became the term is hypermosia, which means uh, increased sense of smell or decreased ability to detect smell. And uh, when these people described exactly the same thing that Helen Keller was describing, it really vindicated what she was writing about. And so it just goes to show you the power of our senses. This is just the sense of smell. And with your friend uh, being able to recognize people by touching their hand. Absolutely. It's a sense of touch. So in the book Blind Zen, I, I go into, you know, how to develop smell and, and sense of touch, sense of direction, sense of hearing, um, all of which to uh, get a better idea of what's going on in the world around you. For example, um, you're walking down the street and uh, you can hear footsteps behind you. But can you tell it? If it's a big guy or a woman, if it's two people, if it's children, um, actually you can. The, it's really simple. All you have to do is turn around and look and remember what the sounds are made by those types of people. And you do that over a period of a few months. You listen for the sound. You look and you check out the source of the sound and you recognize what kind of people made the sound. After a couple of months, you can walk down the street and when you hear footsteps behind you, you can tell, remember what you were saying before, that you're scanning and scanning and you're looking around, you got your head up. Mm -hmm. Well, now you've got your ears working for you, too. So now it's almost like, you know, superhuman powers. You hear somebody behind you. You can tell if it's a 200-pound guy or if it's, uh, you know, a 135-pound girl in, in running shoes. You'll be able to tell the difference. It's not, you know, psychic powers or anything. It's simply becoming aware of, of, of uh, uh, sensory information and categorizing it and learning uh, to recognize that, that uh, type of uh, information. But, you know, who, we, we never do that. We hear a set of footsteps. We keep walking. You know, mm -hmm. we don't to really check it out. You know, we don't, you know, try to listen for the sound of it, the, you know, the patter. Or the, uh, the I usually glance back. Yeah, I usually do, too. And yeah. then you start to recognize the sounds, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, the sense of smell. My husband says... Every person smells different, and he associates, you know, the people with the smells. Like he said, oh, I smell like caramel. Oh, that's good. Nice. I like that smell of caramel. Yeah, I said, well, that's pretty good. If you just said, you know, rotten eggs or something, that wouldn't have been so nice. But <laughs> I can live with caramel. And he said uh, his mom smells like apples. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, there's another thing that I came across, and again, all this is actually goes back to self-defense training and, 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 and martial arts, is being able to you know, be aware of things that other people aren't aware of. But um, there's a sense called synesthesia, and uh, some people have it, and it's really bizarre. What happens is that something is not filtered properly, like our brain's filter most of the information out or otherwise you know we would be overwhelmed with everything that goes on around us so our brains are basically filtering things out and in some people the filters don't work too well and what happens is sensory information crosses over so somebody who is uh, what they call a synthetic they will hear for example say some music but that music will also have a texture for them. They will feel a texture or uh, somebody can uh, 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 smell something and that smell will be a color to them. And yes, so, yes. I, I've watched some documentaries about that kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, it, the interesting thing about that for me is that Oh, my God, the amount of information you can actually get through your senses. You, you know, music has a color. Music has a texture. Music has a smell. Smell has a color. Smell has a texture. <laughs> do, you know, you, do, do you think it's possible that maybe some of their junk DNA, as it's called, is uh, active, activated? 
it could be, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer in epigenetic uh, influences, you know, that your environment will trigger certain genetic traits to come forward. And I, yeah, I think that's a really, a, a, you know, provides a lot of hope for people because. Would, uh, would you uh, mind going into a little more explanation of that, please? Epigenetics? Yes. Uh, well, we have the theory of genetics, and that is, you know, your your tastes, your abilities, and everything is inherited directly from your parents through the genes. Uh -huh. Now, epigenetics may have to do with the junk DNA that's in there, and um, it is triggered now, they find, by environmental uh, factors. I'm trying to remember the, um, for example... Um, Let's say you, you inherit a gene that uh, doesn't allow you to gain a lot of weight. So you know those types. Uh, that, they can would eat like, nice, that would be a nice gene to have, yes. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> no, i got a buddy like that. He's always been skinny his whole life. He's still is skinny. You know, he can eat whatever. And he, his problem was always trying to gain weight. So he might have inherited that, that gene. But in another situation, in times of famine, it might trigger – Another gene that would pack on the weight, which is a survival mechanism, which is why, you know, uh, uh, a lot of uh, First Nations people tend to be kind of heavy because they've had so many uh, droughts and famines in their history that the gene for putting on weight was a survival mechanism. And then when you find yourself in a calorie rich environment, you tend to gain more weight. And um, um, so, well, OK, so now you're chubby, but you're the one that would survive a a, a famine, you know. Uh -huh. So this is where the environmental conditions would trigger a gene to come into play. And that gene will now modify your behavior and it can even modify your body. So this is really kind of interesting because uh, it opens up a world of possibilities of you know, enhancing one's ability to detect things. And also going back to the smell, um, you know, a lot of times we have kind of a hunch about feelings or we get a bad feeling about somebody. Now, it may be that that bad feeling or even a good feeling, it doesn't matter, like you get an instinct about somebody, he's a good person, he's somebody not to be trusted, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe what you're doing is you're smelling that person's personality, but because our brains tend to repress most of the sensory information, that that smell of a bad personality doesn't really reach your consciousness, your you know your forebrain, but instead kind of resonates with this kind of feeling that you have. So, what if we can you know develop our brains and develop our minds to perceive more things around us, then. You know, you meet somebody and you go, something smells fishy. Where do you think that is <laughs> from, right? <laughs> right? I like that. I like that. <laughs> of course it smells fishy because that's probably what's really happening. You're kind of in a subconscious level, you know, or below consciousness. Your body is picking up information that tells you this person is to, not to be trusted. The problem is... You know, we've been taught and educated and socialized and uh, to ignore that type of information from an early age. And so it never reaches our ability to recognize it for what it is. And instead, we have a hunch. We have a feeling. We have the sixth sense, you know. So there's a lot of things like that, that uh, a lot of that I deal with in the book Blind Zen. It's, it's not just for blind people. If you're interested in sensory enhancement and learning how to fight with a blindfold on, uh, that book's for you. But more, uh, and I'm going to d deal with this in an upcoming book too called The uh, Fourth Way of the Warrior, where I, I go into all the kind of sensory enhancement techniques. It's, it's almost... You know, I'm a very skeptical person. I've always looked for a scientific explanation for, you know, psychic powers and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, honest, uh, it, it, it's true. You know, you, if you train long enough in uh, the way of Zen and the way of the warrior, uh, you do get kind of psychic powers. And, uh, and, and, and I attribute it to the increase in sensitivity and the ability to perceive things. But for most people, it, it looks almost like a sixth sense. You can almost read minds, you know. Uh, the sense of smell, would that also explain the indefinable charisma that some people have? That could be it, too. 
you know. They just because, give out a smell that attracts you to them, but uh, subconsciously. Well, Helen Keller mentioned that, absolutely. She said she could smell personalities, and she said that interesting people had a very strong and interesting smell, and that people that were really dull and uh, really, you know, weren't much to speak of had very little smell. So uh, when your husband was saying that, you know, he senses all these smells coming from you, that might be an indication that you have a very good personality because you're giving off a distinct smell that your husband likes. And that <laughs> might be, you know. <laughs> well, I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, now, uh, since, you, since you have followed this and, and done the martial arts, do you feel like you almost have a sixth sense? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't want to talk about because it, it sounds like, you know, all oh, you're bragging. You know, I, I, and, I, and again, I don't believe in psychic powers per se, um, you know. Um, so you're basically picking up on clues that people are giving you that you are in tune with that say, I wouldn't even perceive. But but you would be able to read read that person just by their yeah what yeah and it, and it comes from you know years of studying it that, yeah yeah all all those things that they're giving up the way they walk the tone of their voice their the body language the the way they dress uh, the words they use um, you know it all adds up to a big picture and um, it it's almost yeah I don't know how to say it there there's something there. Um, and uh, I, I can't define what it is, and, and I don't want to make any kind of claims for myself as being, you know, more superior or, or something like that. Uh, it's it's really got nothing to do with that. I think it's a skill that people can learn. But, you know, you got to be <clears> – <throat> yeah, there, it's a skill some people can learn. Exactly. Let me just, yeah. I've always said that the better psychics are extremely good people readers. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, it, it, it's there's people that they're just a dim light bulb and they will never learn anything. They, just, they will never end, understand this. And so, from their perspective, yeah, then it's psychic powers because you know like, they're they're so unaware of things. Then 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 you know even a little bit of perception seems like magical powers from their perspective. I imagine I don't know because they're usually so dull you can't even get them to read to understand their own situation. Um, but for people that are a little bit more aware and have a conscience and have a desire for knowledge and want to know things, say you know. I, People ask me, well, how come you can do all this stuff and uh, it takes so much discipline? Well, no, it's it's not discipline. I want to know. I enjoy learning it, and, and I jo enjoy finding things out. So it's not like I force myself to learn things. Oh, geez, you know, I'm going to sit down and crack this book and learn this stuff. I, I devour information. I love it, you know. So there is no need for discipline. It's what I do naturally. And if you have that lust for knowledge and and that desire for wisdom, you just absorb this stuff. And when you absorb enough of it, you start to function at a higher level. I don't know how else to describe it. It's just you're more sensitive, more aware, and uh, you'll be able to perceive things that may seem miraculous, you know, may seem uh, extraordinary. Uh, um, well, would any of this be based on like an IQ level? Like if somebody has a low IQ, it would be really difficult for them to absorb a lot of this knowledge, correct? Well, yeah, I, I recognize three types of IQ. Um, the IQ, the intelligence quota, which is based, based uh, mostly on you know information and knowledge. And yeah, you can't be an idiot, you know, but you don't need to be a genius either because there is a, a, a kinesiatic intelligence. So someone is, like me who's kind of like middle of the road, I'm smart enough to know that I'm not that smart. I could absorb some of this if I really sat down and focused on it. Well, absolutely, because it's not just the intelligence. Um, it's, it's the body. The kinesiatic intelligence is even smarter than the brain intelligence on many different levels. And so uh, if you're uh, – there's people that 
you know, might not be great at, you know, cracking a book and regurgitating all the information in that book, mm -hmm. um, but they're brilliant dancer or they're a great ice skater or they're good at downhill skiing or they can ride a horse or, you know, these are things that require a body intelligence and a body intelligence is really important to it. It's to me, it's as important as the intellectual intelligence. And then there is a third type of intelligence called the EQ or the emotional quotient. Um, and that is um, sort of the feeling part of a person, you know, uh, how much heart you have, how much empathy, how much compassion. And when you have empathy, you feel what other people feel. So it's like reading their minds. Now, it's not intellectual. You're not, you know hearing their thoughts in their head no. but you are feeling what they are feeling which is what's more important what they're thinking or what they're feeling right so an eq is just as important to me all three of those intelligent quotas are uh, equal they all have advantages and disadvantages um iq is good but iq is slow and stupid um if you're in a, an emergency situation and you have to move fast Thinking your way through it is too slow. You have to react from instinct, and that's your body intelligence. Your body will know how to move and how to get out of it and, and where the obstacles are. Your body figures that out. It's not your brain, you know. And um, when dealing with people, like, for example, what we were talking about with anger and aggression, well, your emotional uh, intelligence is way more important in that situation because you'll be able to feel what they're feeling and you'll be able to feel whether or not they're ready to go to violence or whether they can be appeased or the situation can be dissipated. Your intelligence is too slow for that. It, it works on a slow level. So <clears throat> they, all ha they all have advantages, but I think IQ is overrated a lot. Certainly in a, any kind of a survival situation, yeah, it's good to have some knowledge. But if you can't actualize that knowledge through feeling and movement, which is your emotional and your body equivalent, uh, body intelligence, then just knowledge by itself isn't enough. You know? um, I tend to react really well in crisis situations. I stay calm and do what has to be done. It's little things like losing my keys that throw me into an absolute and complete panic. Mm -hmm. So well, <laughs> I don't know what uh, what that would be, but I've yeah, always well, ten your... tended to handle the huge crises in my life extremely well. That would be your body intelligence. Um because that's your instinct taking over. And it's very, uh, it, it's typical in that kind of a situation. For example, if you were just, uh, you know, IQ centered, you know, focused only on your brain, then during a pressure situation, you'll tend to break down. I think, you know, judging from what you've told me, that you're probably more centered in the, in the kinesiatic intelligence, which means that things that shouldn't bother you tend to bother you because now you're working on a, a, on a on an emotional and intellectual level but when a crisis happens you, boom you switch over into instinct and it's that instinct that keeps you calm and uh, allows you to react and do the right thing for that situation but that instinct doesn't kick in unless it's really a dangerous situation you know? <laughs> so uh, or or you're pressure right uh, exactly so that would like yeah so that's a good thing to have i'm the same way too uh um, i've had situations where oh my god i'm in danger and boom i kick into this instinct and uh i'm calm and uh i managed to do the right thing and say the right thing and i could never plan that in a million years you know i i if somebody said well here's the situation and uh you've got three days to think about what you would do I couldn't do it. <laughs> you know, I couldn't plan it all. I about. would be totally at sea and have 900 pieces of paper with scribblings surrounding me trying to figure out point A to point B. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, 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 we, we talk about this with my, my police officer friend because he's very into the, the Zen too. And this man has gone through combat and, uh, and, uh, 
when he was teaching, you know, uh, hand-to-hand combat at the police academy, they'd always give him that question. And as a martial arts instructor, I always get the same question too. Well, you know, if a guy came up to you and he's got a knife and he does this, what would you do? Well, both his and my answer have always been the same. I don't know. <laughs> I'll know when it happens, you know, because I can't tell you what I'm going to do, right? But I do know that if somebody is running at me with a knife or a baseball bat or something like that, what I will do is the right thing that is needed to be done in that situation, depending on all the variables that are going to occur within a moment's notice. And this is not something you can plan out intellectually because every situation is dynamic. Maybe it's a big knife. Maybe it's a small knife. Maybe he's got a buddy with him. You know, there are all kinds of things that, that, that factor into the situation that you can't pre-plan using your intellect. And you have to have trained your instinct and then your instinct takes over and deals with the situation. And I think that's what you're talking about when, when you're under pressure that, you know, there's a crisis. Um, I do not like confrontation and I will avoid confrontation at almost any cost, but don't ever put me in a corner because only one of us is coming out and it's not going to be you. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be me. (laughs) But, yeah, confrontation makes me extremely nervous and agitated, and uh, I will go to great lengths to avoid it. Sure. when it comes to your back against the wall, then, yeah, I will confront you in a very bad way. Yeah. Yeah, so I would would – hazard to guess that that is your 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 moving center your kinesiatic intelligence or your instinct kicking in and uh, it's a good uh, skill to have isn't it uh yes it is um it's got me through to this and like i said i've tried to instill this in my girls never be a victim always be aware always have a backup plan know what you're going to do if somebody confronts you you know, scream. Don't ever be a victim. If somebody tells you to be yeah. quiet, do not be quiet. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the same studies uh, that they did in, uh, found that people that do fight back tend to survive. You know, uh, make it, you know, as much trouble for them as possible because uh, uh, going along with them is more likely to result in, in trouble and certainly never be a allow yourself to be taken to a secondary crime scene is what they call it. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll see you on the street and then they'll say, okay, you know, get in the car or I'll, or I'll shoot you. No, it's better you make the run now uh, Mm -hmm. because once you're in the car, now your chances of escape. Remember every time they try to move you to another location, it's always in the advantage of the predator. And even if they're holding a gun at you, um, if you're walking down the street and somebody pulls a gun and says, you know, get in the car, you're better off running at that point than getting in the car for a number of reasons. One, that person might be more hesitant to use a gun while standing on a public street with a bunch of people around that could possibly hear or there might be police cars nearby and draw a lot of attention to himself by firing off a handgun. Um, then after he's gotten you in the car and driven you out to the woods, then he's perfectly free to use the handgun and nobody's going to come. Second, even if he does shoot, um, people are, uh, especially criminals, notoriously bad shots. They uh, they did a study about uh, um, where they analyzed all the gun battles that police engaged in, and uh, they found out that most gun battles occur within 20 feet. So you know that's you know a small uh, small bedroom, right? <laughs> and run in a zigzag pattern, right? <laughs> and run in a zigzag pattern, and then with the shots, number of shots fired by criminals within a 20 foot range, <clears throat> 90 percent of the time they miss. So even if that person is you know, aiming a gun at you, um, you know, try to distract them. I always recommend some kind of a distraction, throw some keys or something at them or point over his shoulder and say, please, arrest this man or something, you know, get him distracted and then run like hell because in about two seconds you can get 20 feet on him. And after that, he's only got a 10% chance of hitting you if he shoots. And even if he does shoot and hit you, um, there's only, again, a 10% chance that that wound would be fatal. 
And so you're better off being wounded in the street where there might be, you know, people that can come and help you and rush you to a hospital than to be taken away in the car and uh, shot and uh, left for dead in the woods where nobody's going to find you and take you to a hospital. Exactly. So- well, Stefan, we got about two minutes left. Uh, thank you for staying on with me this hour. Uh, oh, you are. I have enjoyed it tremendously, and you have given a lot of practical, fantastic advice. And if you want to give out your website again and your books, feel free. Sure. The uh, The name of the book is The Art of Urban Survival, uh, Family Safety and Self-Defense Manual, because it's meant for the family. There's chapters in there on how to keep your kids safe, you know. And there's nothing in there that's, you know, going to scare anyone. It's very practical advice and, and very sane. And uh, the website is ChinaStrategies.com. Okay. Well, I hope that you will be able to come on again and that uh, Kathy's issue won't have the issues that she's had tonight. Yeah, I'd be happy to come back on. And Kathy, if you're listening, I'm sorry we missed out. You, uh, we missed you the last hour. I know, I know. But uh, like I said, thank you for staying on with me. And uh, it's been great. I have learned so much. And folks, pay attention to oh, the dog. If they don't like a person, there, there's probably a good reason for that. So pay attention to your dogs. <laughs> I do, yeah. I do, too. If my dog yeah. doesn't like somebody, I'm not going to like them either. Yeah, and conversely, dogs love me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> People walk by with their dogs, and the dogs see me, and they go, whoop, you know, they come running, and, you know. I'm so a cat, that's a good sign. You know? I'm a cat whisperer. Cats seem to like me. Oh, I have three in the house here. I'm not even going to tell you how many we have because it's totally embarrassing. Yeah, I'm I'm the crazy cat man. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, folks, I hope you enjoyed the show. And uh, Stefan, please, uh, I'm sure Kathy will have you back again. Uh, Very enjoyable. People, look for his books. There's a lot of good smarts in there. You can learn all kinds of things. Yes. Uh, My name is Liz, by the way. I'm I'm not just Studio B Switchboard. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And uh, I will look for your books that, uh, what was it, Blind Zen? Uh, Yeah, that's for for blind people uh, or vision impaired. And uh, that's it. You have a great night, Stefan. And thank you again. Good night. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you.